Hey everyone, this is D7 from D13 Airsoft, and as is the trend on this channel, I am going to continue posting things that has nothing to do with Airsoft. Um, so this is a, as you can tell by the title, a review or overview of my current primary AR-15 setup, obviously a real firearm, not an Airsoft gun. Um, some of the parts I take and put on an Airsoft gun when I'm not using it, but really, you know, this is a real still video. So how it's going to work is you want to start from butt to tip because we'll special like that around here and we are going to show just everything I have on it the rough cost it took to get to each one and then we're going to zoom in a little bit closer and show why I have it in a certain setup so with that said I've owned this rifle for about a year and a half um, I think what I'm going to do is every year or so give a yearly update and see what's changed talk about the round count and so on now for and we have an SMB tactical brace. Um, how I mean, it's just standard pistol brace. I forgot what model specific from them, but you can get that for around about 100, 150 bucks, I think. Um, if some of these prices sound a bit high, do take into account I did make most of this build while I was up in Alaska, so shipping costs, etc. Do make it a little price in the way you see in level 48, sometimes even in other countries. So take that into account. Um, next up, we're moving to the multicam sling. This is a uh, Vickers Tactical uh, adjustable two-point sling. It, I mean, it's really good. It's thin, which I like. Um, sometimes if you want a heavier, if you have a heavier rifle, you may want to have a wider sling. Sometimes with padding. For me, it's not necessary for this build. Um, so I just want something that's thinner, kind of out of the way when messing with gear. And this is adjustable two-point. Uh, the days of one-point slings, three-point slings are largely just kind of being phased out by a lot of people in the gun community and for me personally I just prefer the two-point adjustable sling and what you can't see is on the other side of the rifle there is a little notch with some paracord that allows you to adjust it pretty quick to tighten or loosen the sling on you you can get those for around 50 60 dollars at the end of the brace and we'll zoom in on it later that's my zero hold card that I have printed out um, put on the paper uh, so I put it on the, the brace and then taped over so easy access to look at it. So if I'm ever needing to, I can take a look at it. So, But we'll zoom on that later. Uh, next up, at, this, at the end of the tube, you got a QD point uh, plate, which I don't use anymore. haven't used it for a while, but I just kept it on there. You can get those for around $15, $20. I can't even remember the company that made it. For the grip, we have the Magpul MOE style of grips. Inside of it is a compartment with a lever at the bottom to store stuff. For me, I have the insert for the CLP or lubricant oil bottle. The reason I did that was because of it's being shot suppressed. Sometimes you need the extra lube versus an AR that, you know, it, once you lube it, it's usually good until you clean it again if it's unsuppressed. With suppressed, you get a lot of gunk in there, so I got that. You can get that whole setup for around $50 $60. The actual lower is a PSA lower that allows you to actually put a brace on it. Um, got around $250. Some of you might be thinking, why PSA? Because it's pretty affordable and it does get the job done for at least me so far. Maybe in these annual videos I'll start with this rifle, maybe we'll come to find out years down the road. It's not, but for so far, I think it's done pretty well. Now, one caveat to that is the trigger. I've heard a couple people complaining about it, and I would agree. It's advertised as a mil-spec trigger, but it does tend to be a little bit heavier than some mil-specs. I haven't put it on the weight scale or anything to test it, but you can kind of feel it. Is it a big deal? Not for me. Um, again, I've owned this for a year and a half. I have no desire to put a trigger pack in. I got other things to put money on, so I have no desire to do so. Uh, one issue I had with it, though, is you can see the two pins near the trigger and bolt catch. Yeah, keep those components inside the lower. Uh, when I first got the rifle, they were slowly coming out after repeated round use. Uh, it's very easy to catch. You can just push them right back in. But in theory, if you let it continue to happen, you know, you could have parts just flying off. Now, that within the first 500 rounds, no matter how much you clean it, you do get some carbon up in those crevices, and it does make the pin stay in. And then when I started to spray paint the rifle, they stayed in and since then have had no issues. But when you first get it, do take that into account. Uh, maybe that'll make you rethink that lower. That's fine. Uh, moving on is the upper. So that's a BCM 11 half inch upper with a M lock rail. So uh, there's a lot of options on BCM site. Um, well, I'll, get, I'll get to it later on why I chose that one. 
But that whole setup, including the bolt carrier and the BCM charging handle, you can get around $1,000. That includes shipping and handling. For the charging handle, uh, I replaced that charging handle with a Radeon Raptor SD. You can get that for around $85, $90. It has vents on it that help mitigate a lot of that gas pressure coming back on you with that suppressor. And so I, that's why I got it. And it does help uh, it, a little bit, but it doesn't stop it completely. And you can definitely still get your eyes watered with iPro on. For the rear sight, we got a ModTech rear sight, uh, very similar or exact to the U.S. Army issued. I'm used to that rear sight. Um, it works great for my purposes. Uh, what you can't see is on the left side of it is a dial that goes from 200 to 600 yards. Once you zero it at the 300 yard mark, you can, in theory, just aim and point with basic fundamentals with that front sight, hit a human sized target at 300 yards. And then if you need to go further than that, uh, once it is zero, you just hit that dial to say the 400, five or 600 yard mark. And in theory, you could still hit a human sized target without re-zeroing. Pretty nifty. Um, I've never shot past 300 yards of this build. Um, and then with that barrel length, I probably won't for a hot minute, but I'm gonna give it a shot and I'll probably test out the iron to see how much that dial actually works. But in theory, it should. And it's a pretty neat concept. Also like you can lower the top part of the actual sight so you can put optics over it. And that works for a plethora of optics. Uh, I will say for this one, the spring on it's quite stiff, which is good so that the recoil won't make that spring tension go up on the sight. I did have one Matek on here in the past that was very loose. So every time I shot, that sight would be rubbing against the bottom of the magnifier. And if I flipped that magnifier and flipped it back, I would have to push that sight back down. Um, slight, you know, you know, issue, but do take that into account. Do test it before you buy it if that spring tension is good on that sight, if you're able to. And you get those between 50 to 80 bucks. You can also score them a lot cheaper sometimes. The actual optic setup, I have a EOTech. EXSPS2 with a times 3 magnifier. So that setup usually runs you around $1,100 to $1,300. Um, I got incredibly lucky and got it for around $400. Um, that is a hefty steal. Um, it's a long story how that happened, but it's not normal to see that. So for those trying to look into this, you will be coughing up a decent amount of cash. Um, times 3 magnification, I like it. Um, it allows me to flip it to the side. And then the EOTech, it does have IR or NVG a reticle compatibility. So if I ever use it with night vision, I can passive aim with it, though it is not on a riser. The, it takes a single CR123 video, uh, battery. And then on a prior video, I did the battery life on it on its highest setting around 17 hours. Um, so make sure you carry some spare batteries depending on what you're doing. And that is also the four dot version. So it's not just a donut of death. You got four different reticles on it that gives you different distances. When we go to my zero card, you get a better look at that. Now, uh, moving on is the Magpul angle grip. So I have that down here. Got, you can get it around $30. Next is the T-Rex arms dual pressure pad uh, for a Surefire style tail cap and then a PEC 15. Though as you see here, that is a Steiner laser device and they take the same end cap, so they're compatible. Um, double check with TRX on his website before you purchase it if you're not going to get PEC 15, but it does work. Um, you can get it for around $125. Uh, I highly recommend it. I do like it. Um, the only issue I have with it is one of the pressure pads has a little dimple that tells you which one it is, which is really easy to input, and the other one that lacks it. Um, so it's a little harder to press down. It's harder to actuate it until that's actually working. Um, but, it, you know, I I'm okay with it. I'm not planning on replacing it anytime soon. I've also put tape back here to wrap some of that wiring up to keep it from fraying about. Next up is the Surefire Scout Light. Um, this is just one of their smaller ones, and it is you can get around $300, $350 on the website. I think that's how much I paid for it, and it's worth it. Surefire is good. There's some better companies out there for weapon lights, but Surefire is still a really good standard to have, so I would recommend it. Um, on top of that light, we have a 100 Concepts light cap. I'm pretty sure that is the small, maybe the medium size one. Uh, when we get closer to a rifle, we'll zoom in. I'll show you how that works, but it keeps the flash of the end of the flashlight from shining if you're not using it, which is great for daytime use and also protects it um, from debris. For all the airsofters watching this, if you have a light for airsoft use, highly recommend it because even a lot of good gun lights can still get cracked from airsoft BB. 
Next up is the laser device. It's the Steiner, Steiner Otal C. You can get these for around $750 um, in comparison to the price tag of PEX, Ingalls, Malls, etc. Yeah, it's a pretty decent price in terms of IR devices. The trade-off is it is only IR laser only. There's no IR illuminator. Um, in a completely dark environment, inside a building by yourself, etc., it seems to work quite well. Though I will give the caveat that if you're out in the snow, that light disappears without a luminaire within 10 feet. And you have a bunch of flashing lights, gunfire, airsoft BBs, whatever it may be. Take that into account that IR laser without a luminaire is going to be disappearing very quick. It's also only civilian powered. So that price tag does come with a couple of cons. Um, if you don't really know what type of IR device you want to get and you don't want to buy something like Hollow Sun made in China, you know, a Steiner is a good option to test it out. But, you know, don't fool yourself. There's a lot of better options out there. And I'm still on the fence um, if I will replace that. But for now, I do have it on there. Next up is the, uh, at the bottom, at the selling point, you have a mid, I'm sorry, no, uh, Midwest Industries uh, fixed front sight. So that is a very thin front sight. I was able to Allen wrench onto the front of the rifle. What that is meant for is if you have a PEC-15 or any laser device like the Steiner, it allows you to have a very thin, so the laser can still go around that sight. If you had, say, a fixed front sight or a very wide front sight that did not fold down, there's a chance you could cover up your laser and kind of defeat the purpose of it. Uh, but I also like both the look of the front, the a fixed sight, and also I don't like folding sights, at least on the front, taking up a lot of the real estate. So I just wanted a fixed one. I did like it. And it works quite well. I've zeroed it with the Matek rear sight, and it works quite well together, especially with the height diff uh, the height being roughly the same. That is something to take into account when you're zeroing your iron sights. And you can get that for about $150. Um, if you're not using a laser device, you can really cheap out and get a much cheaper fixed front sight. But again, I wasn't sure what lasers were compatible with what front sights, so I went ahead and paid extra money for that. Next is the Surefire Mini 2 Suppressor and 556. Um, with the $200 tax stamp and the, goodness, 13-month wait, you were looking at around $1,000 for that setup. Um, and underneath it is a $200 uh, Surefire War Comp, uh, not War Comp, um, the Four Prong, uh, whatever it's called, but the, the Flash Shider, excuse me. And it has a quick release mount on it. Uh, I can't do it with one hand, so I'm not going to show it. But it's also kind of a gimmick because after a couple hundred rounds, you kind of need a mallet to smack it off anyway. And you got to wait a couple minutes before it gets cool enough to do so anyway. So, you know, kind of shows what happens when you plan for something, you purchase ahead of time, then you get the suppressor and realize, you know, it's kind of a gimmick in a certain way. But you know, I, I see the value into it. It's better for maintenance cleaning than anything else than, say, switching it onto a different rifle, which it's not particularly realistic, but that's fine. Um, and then lastly, we had a BCM QD mount at the bottom uh, for the sling, though as we get closer, you see that I do not actually have a QD mount in it. Instead, I use paracord. Okay, so that's all the components to this rifle. Next, let's go a little bit closer in and show um, why I did what I did with this build, right? So in terms of range, I was trying to see within 300 yards. In the future, I like to shoot further than that just to test out what it's capable of. But at the end of the day, it's 11 half inch barrel. The velocity is just not going to make it that far from 5.56 round. So, with that said, um, looking closer in here, it's upside down. We get the idea. Uh, no, I'll, I'll spin it around. All right, so we got our donut of death picture. Uh, what this is showing is what my what you would see in my down sights with the four dot EOTech. Um, first one, just zero to 300 meters. Um, and then you just keep going down. In between is four targets less than 12 inches. I found that if you shoot in a very small steel plate or target like that, sometimes the height of a board does make you want to aim a little bit higher for that round to hit it, especially if you're going out in 300 meters. Um, also, I'm using 300 meters and yards interchangeably here. That's the wrong answer, but yeah, let's go with it. Uh, I would recommend doing this. Um, it helps me out. Uh, even if I don't have many rifles I change between, it does help out a lot. Just from reminding myself, hey, what's my hold in uh, the rifle? And if something were to happen, I had to give this rifle to someone else in emergency, they could just look at that and it helps idiot-proof it. Um, you can look up how to do this. You can just tie your sling like this in storage to keep it from fraying about. Um, obviously, you would loosen up when you want to use it. Um, let's see here. Okay, so optic setup. So the reason I did it like this is one, 
I wanted to do something that could be used for both night vision and also uh, longer range use. So the Time Suit Magnifier with the Eurotech is a great combination. If I'm not removing it, I'm not, if I don't want to remove it, I can just flip it. It usually flips out of the box to this side, but you can change these two screws here and just swap it and it works that way. What this allows me to do is flip up this rear sight, say something would happen to Eurotech, whether I don't have time to turn it on or the battery just dies out and I don't take it off. I can still see through the Eurotech to that front sight. So it allows me to have multiple layers here of being able to still aim and shoot at the target. Um, one flaw I will say is if you look here at the um, detached lever on the magnifier, when it comes out of the box, it usually juts out for about quarter, maybe half an inch longer out. If I had this on the other side, which I originally did, this Modtech site is too close to it. So what I did is I got some bolt cutters and just chopped it down. And I'm still able to take this off pretty well and it helped make it get right snug next to it and maximize that rail space. Um, pretty extreme measure for the price tag with those things, but I, I went for it and you know, I'm not, I don't regret it at all. Uh, let's see here, tape, I talked about why I taped it that way. Uh, pressure pad, so I used to have it on the left side and it's very hard to get with that with my left hand with the way I hold the rifle. So having this vertical grip here uh, allows me to put my thumb over here on the other side of the laser because it was a small uh, plate the laser is attached to with the quick mount on the rail. Great place for your thumb, fingers go down here. And then if I ever need to use the light, I just bring it slightly back and press here and that allowed me to use the light and press this one for the laser. If I'm ever going in something that's long term, so if I'm going into a building in daytime, I'm just gonna keep it this way. Light's gonna be more important. But if I ever in a situation where I know, hey, if I am gonna use night vision from, say I'm going to a, a shooting course where I know there's gonna be a nighttime dedicated section, or hey, you know, if I have this setup, which I do have a similar setup on my airsoft gun, if I ever use any of this uh, night vision equipment for a airsoft game, there's usually a transition from daytime to nighttime games. So what I can do is just remove this tape and flip it so it's easier to press whatever is on this segment of the rail easier. Um, outside of that, again, I talked about the laser, kind of just figuring that out. Um, the M-Lock, um, eh, I mean, it's M-Lock. I'm okay with it. I have another rifle that has quad rails on it, and those are nice too. Uh, at the time, it was just what was available, so I went with it. Same thing goes with the more pencil barrel design inside of here uh, for this 11 half inch barrel. It's okay. Um, it works okay. Um, I've had gotten with some rep, with some loads, including some 77 grains. I get definitely sub MOA with it. I've on average with other loads like 55 and 62 grain, I can get right at one MOA. With that being said, especially with that suppressor, get a couple of mags in, um, starts to get hot, and it does open up to about one and a half MOA. Um, so I mean, it's still a very accurate rifle, but it's not a laser pointer um, in certain situations. So take that into account. Uh, if you want to get something like that, there's plenty of other AR brands to choose from, but they come at a cost. So that's kind of basic idea behind what this rifle is composed of and why the rifle looks like this. Um, I, well, actually, I guess I'll add the bottom here. So this is a standard Magpul Gen 3 mag. Uh, I numbered the mags, so number all your mags. If you have jams, you can take note. And then I have 77 grains in there for now. I am still messing with zeros and accuracy test with it. Um, I usually use 62 grain green tips, but I might be trans transitioning over to 77 grains. Um, but we will see in time. That'll probably be an update video. Now, a couple other notes to add here is the build is the way it is. Um, as of this video coming out, again, I own this for about a year and a half. I have shot around 6,810 rounds out of this rifle. Um, of those 6,810 rounds, 4,072 were unsuppressed with 2,768 being suppressed. Why those numbers are so precise is because every time I go to the range, I take notes and then I put it on a Word doc um, so I can test the round, uh, take note of the round count. Why? Well, it helps you to figure out when parts need to be replaced, which comes the next part. So reliability. So reliability of this setup, um, unsuppressed of those 4,072 rounds, I've had 12 different instances of some variant of jamming, right? This could be double feeding, the round going in and it's an ammunition issue. Uh, it could be something with the magazine, maybe it's an old magazine. Could be there's ice debris or snow stuck inside of it. Uh, maybe I didn't lube the rifle enough. The various reasons, right? Of those, I had about 12. 
which means for every 334 rounds, you are having one jam with this rifle. Now suppressed with the 2768, I'm having close to 15 jams, leading to a jam every 184 rounds. That's a bit nerve wracking in my opinion. And um, you know, there is a reason why. Um, and I don't think it's necessarily the rifle's fault. Uh, first caveats is a lot of times when I go to the range, um, I used to, not often anymore now, but I used to use some steel case, so there's an obvious problem. Two, a lot of times I use spare stand mag style magazines. A lot of them are used or surplus. Obviously, those have been through the ringer. They take, they take a lot, so sometimes they jam. All the mags I really trust are all brand new Magpul mags, and those have been incredibly reliable. And their caveat is a lot of this testing, a lot of the shooting I did with this rifle over the year and a half was in Alaska, where half the year I was shooting this in negative degree temperatures. So using those CLP in negative degree temperatures with those other caveats, yeah, no wonder I get uh, jammed sometimes, right? And that's all on me. I mean, that's just part of why I was testing the stuff in that t temperature. I wanted to see what worked and what failed, but I do give that caveat with numbers like that. Now, a second aspect to why suppressors are jamming so much is over the years, um, up until now, I did not change out that recoil spring. Recoil springs need to change around four to 5,000 rounds. Obviously, we're at 6,810 rounds. So yeah, when I finally pulled that recoil spring out, it was about an inch shorter than what it's supposed to be. Um, what, in addition, the bolt carrier group that was in it, the two state um, screws on top near the gas um, port, or gas tube, I forgot the terminology off the top of my head, sorry. Um, one, one of them was getting pretty loose um, I was able to tighten one of them down and fix the problem, but the other screw was still quite loose, so I went ahead and bought another bolt carrier group. But with what this thing's been through, the environment's been through, the different tests, different stuff I put on it, yeah, no wonder at 6,810 rounds it's starting to crack. Um, but I was able to go to a wrench, fix some of those parts, and it's fine now. So hopefully in the year uh, update video, you're going to see a lot better percentage on reliability of that suppressor. Though I get that caveat. A lot of people praise suppressors like it's the end all, uh, be all, but you know you need to take into account there are some cons with it, and that's one that people may not always talk about, at least not in that type of detail. Now, let's see here, we talked about MOA. There's one more thing I was going to add. Oh well, guess it wasn't important. <laughs> um, oh, no, I do remember. So, this freaking bolt carrier. So, if you're going to use a BCM upper, use the BCM bolt carrier. Um, this is a CMC Triggers uh, uh, enhanced bolt carrier group. It is meant for 5.56 and 300 blackout. That thing caused nothing but jams in this when I attempted to replace the old um, busted bolt carrier group. It was so bad that I would use the old bolt carrier with the flaws anyway, and it will be more reliable than that. Um, so that's there to not recommend it for this build. Um, yep, that's pretty much it. Hope you guys enjoyed it. And uh, hopefully you might see a similar video to this a year from now. All right, bye.